All right, cool. Let's uh, jump into week two of course four. Jess, I mentioned to Tracy that Jose uh, is working on his Masks for Shy project, so is he going to be able to join us today? Uh, <clears throat> but this time around, we're talking about ML and uh, deep learning models. Uh, well, that's what this says. We're also spending a lot of time talking about uh, tree-based models. Uh, and in fact, the learning objectives for the uh, this week up, oh, that should say week two. Um, I'm not gonna try to fix it now, but that should say week two are to uh, really understand tree-based algorithms like decision trees and boosted trees and the like. Uh, explain the use of neural networks in supervised learning applications. Discuss the major variants of neural networks and recent advances. Create and test an instance of Watson visual recognition and create a neural net model in TensorFlow. Uh, so we start with uh, tree-based methods. This is a picture of a decision tree that comes from one of the exercises. Uh, you know, actually I skipped my, my check-in uh, and did not ask where are the two of you in the course? Have, are you up to this module or are you uh, in catch-up mode? I'm in catch-up mode. I, I had a lot going on with work um, this week in particular, so I had no extra time to, to do other projects. I actually forced it. I like said I'm tired of work dominating evenings and weekends, so I actually took most of uh, most of Friday off to try to catch up and got pretty much through it. I ran into um, unfortunately. CUDA TensorFlow versioning problems on my Linux box, mm -hmm. but most of this bat stuff I've been through before, so there yeah. was more review. Yeah, I ran into um, similar infrastructure kinds of things, but it was all uh, like Python, PyN, uh, dependency issues. There's a one of the exercises, actually the, the, the one that produces this graph uses this graph biz uh, module that it took forever for me to get it to install. Um, but, and then for, uh, well, we'll get to the, the uh, CNN stuff later. But in any case, this is a, uh, an example of a decision tree um, the uh, decision trees are learned and they're learned recursively. Effectively, is what effectively what's happening is you're starting with all of your data at the root of your tree, uh, and then the algorithm is looking at each of the features and um, essentially evaluating the features' ability to create kind of pure partitions of the, uh, uh, the data, um, and it does this recursively. So it's, uh, you have this idea of an impurity metric that the algorithm is using to determine how good a split is. Um, and I think I've got a separate slide on it, uh, actually immediately after this one, but basically it's looking at does the, do the partitions created by a split, um, do they have a lot of different classes in them or are they largely composed of a single class? Um, and so the using that impurity metric, the uh, decision tree, the learning algorithm is identifying the feature that minimizes the impurity and uh, the the criteria um, for that feature, so a value of that feature um, that maxim or that minimizes the impurity, and then it uh, partitions the or it splits the tree based on that uh, particular feature. Um, notes the sides of the partition as child nodes of the current node, and then 
um, does some tests to determine if a child node is you know, either pure because it only has one class in it or um, is otherwise constrained by some of the settings for the algorithm, whether you've hit a maximum depth or um, you have not achieved a minimum number of samples uh, for a particular node. Um, in which case you are tagging your node as a leaf and then kind of going back uh, into the recursion. Otherwise, you set it as a child and you kind of start this process all over again. Um, <clears throat> you'll, uh, so for example, um, talked about identifying a feature and a split point or criterion, you know, in this top level, the feature that's used to uh, partition the tree is the country. This is in our avail data set. Um, uh, and then if we um, uh, go down this direction in the partition, we look at the um, avail basic, whether so which of the, um, the avail plans the customer use. Um, and then you can also see here the this Gini, this is the impurity metric that's used for classification, uh, Gini impurity, or at least it's one of them. Uh, any questions on that before digging a little bit deeper into the impurity measures? So the thing ab about that um, is it strikes me um, it's very much like 1970s AI. So, you know, we went from, hey, neural networks are going to be the coolest thing in the late 50s and 60s to, hey, they don't solve the XOR problem, so let's move on to something else. Mm -hmm. And then we got into expert systems, and expert systems were all about querying experts and coming up with a set of rules that effectively is a decision tree. Those were all abandoned later on in favor of SVMs, et cetera, et cetera, because they were so brittle. And so, I mean, it's a little bit surprising that decision trees work so well, given that in the 70s, they were considered brittle. And I guess the solution to that is because two things, one, we're, we're training them versus hand crafting them. Right. And secondly, that we're doing all this ensemble stuff to try to regularize out the brittleness. Would you, is that like a fair assessment in your mind? Yeah, I agree with that. I was going to, to say that the learning, uh, the learned aspect of um, the kinds of decision trees we're talking about here is uh, a big difference from kind of handcrafted, um, you know, expert systems where you, you know, they are rule based, um, but they are, you know, handcrafted. And so they're not, you're not training them based on your, your data set. And then uh, to your second point, you know, we'll talk about kind of bagging and boosting here, but those um, ensembling approaches um, have proven, you know, very strong at um, making these decision trees perform better. So I definitely agree with that. Um, so the uh, impurity measure uh, that I referred to in the previous slide is essentially a cost function that you're looking at when you're constructing your trees. Um, Gini impurity is uh, essentially the probability of incorrect, incorrectly classifying a randomly chosen element in the data set. Uh, if it were randomly labeled according to the class distribution in the data set. Um, in other words, it's, it's basically looking at um, the proportion of um, the proportion of a given class in the data set. And uh, it's kind of summing across all of the um, those proportions times um, the inverse of those proportions. Basically what it looks like is um, you end up with this metric where if you're, um, say your um, 
say you've got 90% of one class and 10% of another class in a given split, then your Gini impurity is going to be uh, 0.9 times 0.1 or 0 0.09. Um, so it's very small. Whereas if you've got half of one class and half of another class in your, um, your partition, then it's going to be 0.5 times 0.5, which is 0.25. So it's bigger. Um, so this Gini impurity metric, the more uh, imbalanced or pure your partition is, the smaller that number is going to be. Um, and so it's uh, essentially trying to minimize, it chooses the partitions uh, and the partition points based on minimizing that metric. And that's for classification, for regression, we're using, um, you know, root mean square error or mean average error, like we talked about last time. The, uh, <clears throat> the advantages and disadvantages section in the scikit-learn uh, docs for decision trees are really good. Um, the next few slides, as well as the practical consideration slides, come from that. From that, the highlighted items are ones that are mentioned in the course. Um, but the you know, in terms of advantages, you know, these decision trees, as we saw earlier, can be visualized. They are fairly easy to uh, interpret and kind of understand. You know what they're doing. Um, they don't require a lot of um, data preparation. So, you know, they can still work if you don't normalize your data, um, if you have blank or missing values. Um, they can handle both numerical and categorical data. Um, so you have the same technique that can do both. They can be used for multi-output problems. So if you are trying to predict two different things, um, you know, one option that you have is to just train two different models on the same data. Um, but sometimes those two things are correlated and um, you can use decision trees to, uh, to train for multiple outputs. Um, and the white box model kind of refers to the interpretability and ex explainability uh, again. Um, in terms of disadvantages, the um, main one is that they can be prone to overfitting, so creating uh, overly complex trees that don't generalize well. Um, and also uh, a degree of instability, uh, whereas um, small variations in the input data would result in, you know, very different trees. Um, the ensemble methods that uh, you mentioned, Tracy, and that we'll talk about are um, kind of great ways to, to fix that and are used to overcome those particular disadvantages. Um, they also are prone to creating biased trees if your classes are imbalanced. So um, it's recommended that you, that you balance your classes before applying decision trees. Uh, any questions on advantages or disadvantages before I um, jump into ensemble methods? All right, cool. Uh, Jess, you mentioned that snorkel is an attempt to bridge those approaches. Were you referring to expert systems and the, that previous conversation? Yeah, that yeah. So, yeah. So talking about um, kind of some of the automated, auto, automated algorithmic approaches versus the use of domain expertise and kind of trying to bridge those. You, you had a, an interview with uh, I guess it was, uh, I don't know if it was the, the team or someone on the team yep. developing Snorkel. And I remember thinking that was a really interesting approach to kind of bridging those those two approaches. I think it was with regard to labeling. Uh, yeah. Sense, maybe. <clears throat> the, um, 
you know, I think of it as kind of roughly in the domain of active learning where you're trying to, um, Snorkel is trying to solve this problem, helping you label data more efficiently by, uh, in part by identifying what's the best data to label. Um, and there is kind of this notion of pulling humans in the loop as part of that process. Yeah, I think what I remembered the, the most out of the interview was um, just kind of the insight that, you know, rather than do this training where you're sort of trying to learn everything, whatever it can from scratch, you can uh -huh. save time by saying, well, we know there are certain certain things that we could build in, you know, as rule sets coming from the domain experts, and then that would speed up this entire process. And I thought that was interesting because I hadn't seen any sort of tool that was doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that reminds me of another interview. Um, oh, what is his name? Um, uh, let's see if I can find it. So I come from, you know, health science domain, and there's just, you know, really the problem with those, with having enough labeled data sets, um, well labeled. And I just remember hearing about snorkel and thinking, well, that's a really unique approach because that that does build in some of the domain expertise, but in a quick way that you then build on with automated systems. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a, a couple of interviews I did. I step. Uh, Stefan Ehrman, I think is Stefan Ehrman. Ehrman. Um, but I've done a number of uh, interviews where, uh, ah, here it is. Here it is, here it is. This was an interesting one along those lines. Uh, so domain knowledge in machine learning models for sustainability. But it's generally the idea of kind of marrying uh, physics-based models or other um, models um, that incorporate human domain expertise with statistical or learned models. Um, there's uh, a lot of interesting work that's been happening in that space, um, and that interview was um, a pretty interesting one along those lines. I think the example that I remember was uh, trying to tr predict uh, build a model to predict the trajectory of, uh, you know, a ball or something that you throw or a pillow or something. Um, and um, looking at a model that incorporates, you know, what we know about the trajectory of from things, you know, i.e. parabolic trajectories um, <clears throat> and kind of complementing that with a machine learning based model. I'll take, I'll take a look at uh, listen, look or listen to that one. Yeah. Uh, so um, there are a couple of ensemble methods that we talk about in the course, bagging and boosting. Bagging is short for bootstrap aggregation. Um, basically, uh, bootstrapping is a statistical technique where you're drawing uh, samples from a uh, distribution or data set and using that to um, using that to produce uh, aggregates or estimations of uh, different characteristics uh, and uh, what is happening with bagging is that you're basically um, you're fitting classifiers on random uh, subsets of your data. So you're sampling your data using bootstrapping uh, and then you're fitting a classifier on uh, that subset um, and then you're um, basically aggregating or averaging uh, those different uh, classifiers that you've created to create a, a meta classifier. Um, in random forest it's essentially applying um, bagging so you know sampling of your your test data set uh, 
but also your features. So you're um, not allowing your decision trees to be created on the entire feature space each time, but on a random subset of the feature space. Uh, and then doing the same kind of aggregation across the um, different decision trees. And then uh, boosting is another uh, approach um, that is basically trying to learn weak classifiers. Um, in some cases, you know, just better than random, uh, and then uh, adding them together to create a strong classifier um, based on these, um, you know, iteratively choosing uh, weak ones. Uh, gradient boosted decision trees um, implemented by XGBoost have become, uh, are super powerful and have become very uh, popular. Uh, and it applies basically um, kind of a gradient descent algorithm uh, where you are identifying these, uh, these weak classifiers by uh, choosing functions that point in the negative gradient direction. So you're kind of, you know, incrementally uh, minimizing your loss. So you're creating a, a tree that is a, that um, you're incrementally creating, uh, rather you're creating a series of these trees that kind of incrementally reduces your loss. Um, but each of the individual trees is relatively simple. And that's one of the big differences between uh, bagging and boosting is that uh, in bagging, you end up with um, uh, kind of fully grown, fully formed uh, trees um, that are your base models. Whereas in, um, when you're doing boosting, you tend to have these very simple uh, trees with very small splits, but it's the aggregation of all of them together uh, that gives you the more powerful model. Uh, another distinction is that uh, with random forest and boosting, because you're basically taking your training data and subsetting it, you can, um, you know, those trees are created uh, are created in parallel so you can um, you can parallelize or distribute that workload whereas uh, boosting is again using this uh, in the case of gradient boosting you're um, identifying your uh, your tree sequentially uh, so you it's much harder to parallelize Um, the, uh, this again comes from the, um, the in practice section of the SK learn decision tree docs, uh, some really good stuff in here. Um, the ratio of samples to features is, uh, important and ha plays a big role in whether your decision tree is likely to overfit. So if you've got a high dimensional space with a lot of features and you don't have what well, you need more, uh, more data uh, to get that to not overfit. So getting that ratio right is something that you wanna pay attention to. Um, <clears throat> along those lines, it can be helpful to reduce the dimensionality of your data before trying to fit a decision tree um, so that uh, you don't overfit and you give the model a better chance of finding uh, signal in the features. Um, <clears throat> it suggests starting with simple trees, like with a max tree depth of three to just get a feel for how the tree, um, how the trees are working uh, and then kind of incrementally increase depth from there. Um, and then, uh, I think I mentioned balancing the training data set uh, as well and paying attention to um, the various kind of pruning criteria, um, such as uh, the minimum number of samples per leaf, uh, 
um, which will help keep you from creating uh, these very overfitted uh, trees. Any questions on decision trees? All right, uh, actually, I think there were some, the course, uh, there were a couple of kind of exercises or examples of decision trees. None of these went into a lot of depth. Um, in fact, this one, the decision tree example, used a lot of the same pre-processing pipeline uh, and data loading. Uh, and, feature name extraction that we uh, saw before, but we just swapped out. Uh, and this is the power of, of this approach, uh, the decision tree classifier in our pipeline. Um, and uh, train that, did okay. Uh, and then this is the, this graph biz um, module that is able to produce your your visualization of your uh, your feature data. I'm sorry, your of your tree rather. Um, and then there is also a uh, a quick bagging example. Uh, this is based on the iris data set. Um, and then for you looking at K nearest neighbors, decision tree and SVM. And for each of them, it creates a bagging uh, classifier. Uh, so you're um, specifying the, the number of the, the number of them uh, using the uh, scikit-learn bagging classifier uh, classifier and you're giving it your base model. Uh, the number of estimates to use, and it's running those. It's not uh, comparing them to the unbagged versions, which would be interesting, kind of an exercise left to the student. Um, but uh, as you can Sam, see- Sam, are you, are you looking at your, um, are you looking at a different screen because you still have decision trees in practice up on there? Uh, yeah, I think I shared the, uh, I think I just shared that particular browser. One second. Whoops. So I'll go back. This is the uh, decision tree example. Um, and this is where we implement the decision tree classifier into the pipeline. Um, and this is, you recall, on the avail data set. This is the picture that I showed you at the beginning of the review. Uh, and then there was another example where we just looked at um, kind of a simple bagging example. They show you know, just statistical bagging uh, up at the top where you're, um, you get 100 samples from a normal distribution and then you um, pull 500 samples with replacement from uh, those samples. And you know we're just showing here that um, you're producing a confidence interval. So you have 95% confidence that your mean is uh, between 50.2 and 48.6. Um, and then, uh, so they're, they're just trying to illustrate bagging as a kind of principle. And then uh, here they're showing the use of scikit-learn's bagging classifier, which can be applied to uh, different types of base models, including k-nearest neighbors, decision tree, and SVM. And I think I was mentioning that they, this is on the IRIS data set, they do uh, fairly well, but uh, they do not compare them to uh, non-bagged uh, versions of these uh, base models. It'd be interesting, kind of an exercise to try out. Uh, let's see, what was this one? I think that's the same one. All right, uh, so you should be seeing the slides. Any questions on the uh, 
guess before I do that, any questions on uh, any of these examples? I think I must have skipped over that section too quickly, maybe because I got stuck and didn't want to try to install the visualization toolkit or something. But I think I have to go back and relook at that. <laughs> I spent a lot of time trying to get this picture. <laughs> Are you talking about the graph viz install on Windows? Uh, well, I was doing it on Mac, um, but uh, I saw in trying to figure out how to get it to work a lot of graph viz install on Windows questions too. <laughs> Lots of trials and tribulations. I, I managed to get mine installed fairly painlessly, but I uh -huh. think at this point it's just because I'm becoming an expert at just instantly figuring there will be a problem with Windows and starting there on Stack Overflow. Mm, that's funny. Yeah, so for me, I think my problem it it wasn't it wasn't all that interesting. It had to do with uh, I think maybe some changes they made in Mac Catalina or something that uh, deprecated some version of OpenSSL, and then um, I had to update PyEM and just a bunch of weird stuff. Uh, a bit of a rabbit hole, but it wasn't related to the particular library. Um, there was a mistake in this where uh, you have to, there's a minor fix that you had to do in here. Like you had to, this convert converts from the PDF to the PNG and it didn't have the PDF extension or something like that. Um, but otherwise it was pretty straightforward to generate the image. So you created that uh, notebook yourself. That wasn't one that they downloaded. You took their the Python code that they created and, and shoved that into Notebook, right? Ah, that's right. Uh, let's see, what did they give? Some of, some of the ones, like I will often take the... Okay, yeah, yeah, so that's the code. And so take the Python code and put it into a notebook. That's right. Okay. I'll also sometimes do stuff like this. Uh, yeah, this was the other one, the bagging example. They just give you the notebook cells, and I put the code into uh, a notebook. And uh, I don't know if I've talked about it, um, but... Uh, I posted it in the Slack. It was, uh, I, I mentioned that um, I'd be posting stuff to GitHub. And this is the repo. I haven't pushed the course four stuff yet, but I'll do that uh, after this. Um, and so if you want to, you know, grab that stuff about all the copy pasting, uh, you can just clone this repo. Nice. Thanks. Sure thing. I was just worried that I had like fallen asleep and hit the uh, next button too fast there. <laughs> no, it was, uh, yeah, I just like to see it in the notebook uh, as opposed to running uh, the, the Python script they give you. <clears throat> All right, so next up, uh, we go to neural nets. Um, they start with kind of a high level discussion of um, four particular types of neural nets. Um, and I'll just kind of review, uh, review that here. And then we explore MLP and CNN in a little bit more detail. Um, so multi-level, multi-layer perceptrons are kind of your standard feed-forward neural net. So you know, if you see a picture of a neural net, it usually looks something like this, although the shapes may vary, and those are MLPs. Um, they are you know, fairly flexibly applied to most supervised learning uh, types of tasks. Um, they consist of, um, you know, these multiple hidden layers as we're shown here and a, a output layer. And we've got an example in the uh, case study that we'll talk about. You're often applying uh, nonlinearity at the end, like a softmax in order to do uh, classification. 
Uh, Autoencoders, they didn't talk a lot about. Um, they are, uh, actually, if you, you may have seen the, the pretty standard picture of an autoencoder. Uh, where you've got this encoder portion and a decoder portion, and then you're constraining your hidden layers in such a way that um, the network is effect effectively reducing dimensionality. Um, so they're <clears throat> used for uh, things like uh, dimension reduction, getting rid of noise, uh, coming up with embedding spaces, that kind of thing. Uh, CNNs are an architecture, a neural network architecture that um, has been demonstrated to perform really well on uh, video data uh, or image data uh, as well as video. And they use a sequence of uh, these different types of layers, convolution layers, pooling layers. Um, convolution layers are basically uh, kind of convolving or scrolling across your uh, image and reducing uh, groups of pixels to smaller numbers of uh, activations. Uh, and this involving process helps the model, um, gives the model properties like uh, translation invariance. So, you know, in this picture, your car doesn't necessarily need to be, if you, if the object is to identify the, you know, the car in this picture, the car doesn't necessarily need to be centered identically in the frame uh, because the convolution, convolution, you know, creates a degree of translation independence. Um, and then you've got these pooling layers, which uh, will take a group of uh, activations and then, you know, further uh, compress or, or pull them down by taking, you know, in the case of max pooling, the maximum, uh, the biggest numbers, uh, the biggest activations. And so that kind of serves to allow the focus, the network to you know reduce noise and focus on what's uh, most important and then you you know convolve more you know you can um, you often see kind of multiple layers of convolution pooling convolution pooling um, until ultimately you, you'll typically see or often see kind of a dense or fully connected, layer basically um, what that is allowing you to do is to uh, it's basically finding linear combinations of your um, your uh, the features that are at the end of your your network um, and then you are if you're classifying you'll apply a softmax to Kind of normalize that to a probability distribution and then you will be looking for the um you know whatever is the highest probability as the thing that your network is predicting uh, and then rnns aren't discussed here but rnns are recurrent neural networks uh, an example of which is um, long short-term memory lstm uh, for rnns I would suggest uh, the podcast I did with Jürgen Schmidhuber, who is uh, the creator of the LSTM. Uh, and that's this one here. There's also a um, Another really good article, uh, Andre Carthy, um, RNs, Unreasonable Effectiveness of RNs. Uh, great article from, ah, it's hard to believe this was five years ago already. Um, but this was when he was first starting to experiment with RNs. Uh, so RNNs 
Uh, RNNs, um, what's interesting about RNNs is that this idea of recurrence uh, means that the networks uh, maintain a degree of state uh, or memory. Uh, and as a result of that, they're really good for uh, sequences. So um, time series data, speech recognition, handwriting, uh, predicting, you know, the um, kind of predicting the, the next word that you're going to type in a, your text message or, or your email. These are all LSTM or RNN types of architectures. Uh, so those are not talked about in uh, much more detail. In fact, only the, uh, none of these are really talked about in a lot of detail. Only the MLP and the CNNs are uh, covered in the case study, uh, which I'll jump over to now. Um, for the case study, uh, ignore the errors there. I switched from doing it on a local, um, a local notebook to collab, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. But basically, yeah, in our avail scenario, we want to uh, create a model that will. Um, you know, we've got uh, the these news videos, uh, news video feeds that come in, but we want to. Uh, make sure that the video feeds that are submitted are actually news video feeds. Uh, so we want to create some kind of classifier. Um, you know that it's there's human in, in the scenario at least there's human moderation, but we want to create a model that can you know um, that can take some of that load off. And so <clears throat> as a benchmarking step, we use the fashion MNIST data set, which we used earlier in the course. I think it was uh, course three, week one. Um, and in fact, most of my code for this case study was cribbed directly from that particular, uh, that particular module. So, um, They've got you check, just checking your hardware setup, making sure you have a GPU and it's accessible. Uh, then you're loading the MNIST, Fashion MNIST data set from Keras, doing some normalization, uh, coming up with your test and train sets, doing some visualization so you know what you're working with, um, showing a bit more of the uh, examples and how they're labeled. Um, showing some summary statistics. And then you want to create uh, a base model uh, for comparison that um, uses uh, PCA for dimensionality reduction and a classical uh, machine learning model. Um, I don't recall if uh, I went and looked at the solution to see if they use the decision tree uh, here. Um, but I used what we used for the, uh, that previous module um, and looked at uh, PCA and a SVM. Uh, so you pass in your uh, grid search parameters. I ended up stopping this because it pegged my CPU for a really long time and I couldn't do anything else and bounced over to uh, running that in the cloud, uh, in this case in Colab. Um, and uh, you can see it's running, you've got your uh, three times three times two, so your 18, uh, grid candidates and five bold uh, cross validation. So it's doing 90 uh, runs uh, and it took quite a while. Uh, I just left it running overnight. Uh, 176 point uh, nine minutes and it was pegging my CPU for the, the whole time. Uh, so about three hours here train time. Um, and uh, the end result is this does pretty well um, at, with an F score, average F score of 
What I find really interesting here is that uh, while this took a really long time, the neural networks did not take a long time at all. Um, and they, uh, the CNN kind of approached this level of accuracy. And I'm not sure if that uh, has to do with the fact that we had access to the, the GPU and we're using the same, or my hypothesis, I guess, is that it has to do with the fact that we're using the same, you know, relatively simple data set and um, have access to the GPU, which the, uh, the SVM isn't able to take advantage of. Uh, so the first part of this is kind of coming up with your baseline. Uh, the next part is um, kind of building out a uh, model with uh, Keras and TensorFlow. I guess before I move on to that, any questions on the, uh, the baseline model? Nope. All right, so then um, <clears throat> with, uh, with uh, Keras, basically you've got this sequential model where you're explicitly telling Keras the layers of your model and you're kind of building up your model by adding layers. Um, this is very similar to the way you might do it in PyTorch, uh, if you're familiar with that or uh, come across that term. Um, <clears throat> the key here that was a little finicky is that you need to make sure that your uh, the network is, it actually wasn't a problem for the simple model, but when you get up to CNNs, uh, I guess I'll come back to that, but the, you know, making sure that your shapes match is uh, important and can be finicky. Um, but the first step is to come up with a simple uh, multi-layer perception, perceptron model. Um, so that consists of, um, you know, you start by flattening your uh, input to a single dimensional input vector. So you're starting with the 28 by 28 uh, tile, uh, and then you're flattening it to a one dimensional uh, input vector and then you've got a hidden layer with 128 uh, nodes and the um, <coughs> your uh, you apply an activation function after that and then you've got another layer with 10 nodes and you're applying an activation function uh, so I my first attempt at this, I kind of literally did what they told you, which is um, uh, build this function and pass the activation function as argument. And uh, so I use ReLU at the, you know, for both activation functions. That doesn't really work well when you're doing a classifier. Um, you want to use softmax as your, the, uh, activation function for your last layer. Um, but I tried them kind of both against one another. Uh, and then this is the CNN. Um, this is a pretty simple CNN model. I think I took this out of the Curious documents, got documentation that they um, pointed you to. And again, uh, it is looking for not just your pixel data, but also your, um, just expects to be told the kind of channel dimension for the 2D uh, CNN layer. Uh, and so when you're using that, um, you have to uh, expand the dimensions in your train and test data, uh, otherwise, you'll spend a lot of time like me looking at Stack Overflow, trying to figure out why your uh, thing is not working. Um, so don't do that. Um, but once you do that, uh, these all train well. Curious has this summary function that allows you to take a look at the model that it has created and the number of parameters at each of the layers. 
Um, the next thing that you're asked to do is to come up with a train function. Um, they asked you to use uh, both model serialization, so checkpointing, which they talked about in one of the videos, um, and also uh, log your runs. Uh, my approach for, I did do the checkpointing that they asked and um, the way that's done is by at each step of um, your model fit or with each of your epics, um, there's a, in, your, in the fit uh, function, there's a callback uh, parameter and you pa pass it a list of callbacks and it will call those callbacks uh, with your um, kind of epic metadata. Uh, and so the your checkpoint callback, uh, this was, I think I got this from the video um, fairly directly. I don't think there was anything uh, interesting there other than kind of changing the way the, the uh, format of the strings. Uh, but in, in <clears throat> for logging, as opposed to kind of writing my own logging and you know, managing a file, I use TensorBoard. Uh, TensorBoard is uh, part of the TensorFlow project and it uh, will, you know, just by, um, you know, giving it a, uh, log directory uh, will create these scalar logs for you and allow you to visualize them. So um, we'll see what that looks like in a second, but you know, I start by training the simple uh, MLP, set the loss function as sparse categorical cross entropy. Um, initially with this from logics, logics equal true, um, but I changed that to false and it did a little better. Um, I think logits equal true is <clears throat> your, you would use that when your input data is a probability distribution and that is not the case for this image data. So it shouldn't, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, but uh, you can run it, you know, both ways just to take a look at it. Um, so here I'm calling the training function. This actually, if you notice, this is a little different. Uh, I introduced the test and train uh, and label data sets as part of the, um, the train function later when I realized that I needed to reshape the, I needed to add that, um, the channels uh, dimension to the input data, uh, but it's the same function otherwise. Uh, so you can get with this really simple uh, MLP, you can get to um, uh, test accuracy, average test accuracy, uh, average uh, accuracy on the test set of 0 0.86. Uh, and then <clears throat> you do your, uh, your training set, uh, test set, uh, reshape those as I mentioned, and you call the uh, train network on the CNN model, uh, and that will get you up to uh, 90.7 uh, accuracy. Uh, so one of the things that one of the things that kind of bothered me about their approach is they glossed over the fact that they were using the test set both for validation and for testing. And I guess all of my knee-jerk instincts are to, you know, have a three-way split into test, validation, and train. And then, um, so I, I was just wondering if anyone else thought that or if they're like, no, no, in this case, it's perfectly fine to, um, to internally record results just on the test set because, you know, that's not informing the training in any way um uh, let's see so for 
So down when you're fitting your model, you're validating the model on the test sets versus a validation set. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a valid concern. You're not doing, it would be worse if you were doing like cross-validation. I don't think we're doing any like hyperparameter tuning in here. Um, it seems like something that was done for convenience rather than for best practice, for sure. Well, but I mean, to, to uh, Sam's point, since you're not doing, since you're not looking for hyperparameters, if you, I guess that's the reason you use validation sets is that you're trying to determine the hyperparameter. But I guess arguably a grid search is doing that. So, um, right. you know, I guess we weren't really, do, were we doing grid search at that point? I don't think we're doing any, um, any uh, hyperparameter searching or anything like that. Um, that would typically be done on things like your batch size and your number of epics and your optimizer or your, uh, your activation function, things like that. We're not doing that. <clears throat> I think validation data here is your, um, you know, when you're training your, uh, looking here, you're, you're giving it basically some way to evaluate the loss at the end of the epic and you're doing that on your uh, your test data as opposed to training on that I think that's standard so um, but just above it is the validation split so it looks like that would be instead of giving it validation data you could say split my data okay. training data into training and is that right so between a fraction of the training data uh, to be used as validation data. Yeah, so you can, uh, <clears throat> you can specify, in other words, you can do your test train split inside of the fit function, um, as opposed to splitting outside of the fit function and passing in the validation data. But it's essentially the same thing. Does so the key sense? point is, does, is, do you get any kind of data bleed um, through the training process by validating on the, and it's not all it's doing, it's saying I'm crunching through my next epoch and I'm not changing anything based on the results, I'm just showing you where we're at in this epoch. So maybe that's the justification. Yeah, yeah, I'm just evaluating the, um, the loss at the end of that training epoch on the test data as opposed to evaluating it on the data that I just trained at, trained on, which would be, that would be um, a problem. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and then at the end of that, I'm doing a. It's uh, kind of the the evaluating the model. Um, you know, independent of these the epic losses here, evaluating the model on the test set and coming up with these accuracy metrics here. Uh, and then the last thing I was going to show was TensorBoard. Um, TensorBoard is pretty cool just by kind of, you know, giving it this directory and, and uh, inserting it into this callback. It is uh, not just creating log files for you, but it uh, creates this visualizer. So uh, this is accuracy. And down here, these two models are the simple MLP. Uh, and then these are different runs of the, uh, the CNN. Uh, actually, the, sorry, this is the, the bad MLP with, uh, with Relu instead of Softmax. And then these are the MLP with Softmax and the CNN model are the ones that perform the best. And then the loss is similar. 
And Thanks for doing that. It, uh, I was on the verge of switching over to CoLab, um, but ran out of time. But and now I think I'm going to go back and do it anyway, just because I don't have the TensorBoard stuff working on my local box as well. And it's really definitely worth playing with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a good a good tool to have in the tool tool belt. Um, and so that's I think uh, that was the end of the case study and the material for this module.